Well, I want to I want to begin by by uh, giving thanks to the Lord because He has brought us to this place. It is through His providence that we are here, and and so I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be in this place. I'm grateful to be surrounded by people that that I love, and that that love me and and my family, and and we're grateful to be um, here in the midst of all of this. And and so what we ought to do together is study God's Word. Amen? Let's do that. So grab a Bible. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 17. And, and if you don't mind, let me set the stage just a little bit. Uh, so starting in John 13, the Apostle John has decided that he would recant, retell, uh, recalibrate our minds by, by speaking of the, what we know of as the Last Supper. And, and that's actually several chapters of content in the book of John is the Last Supper. So you think about what's going on. Jesus rolls in in what we call the triumphal entry in, in about verse chapter 12, and then some things happen and eventually they get into this upper room where, where the Lord then uh, puts a puts some kind of garment around himself, a towel around himself, and he washes the feet of his 12 disciples, which must have been an extraordinary moment. Then, of course, there's uh, the gathering of food, and they eat together, and they have the Passover meal together, and Jesus spends an extended period of time comforting his disciples, giving, him, giving them last instructions, giving them encouragement, telling them what's kind of happening and how it's going to unfold. And then we get to John chapter 17, where the Lord prays. So he's still in the upper room. The guys are there still with, with him. Well, the guys minus one. Of course, Judas the betrayer is, is already gone. Um, but, but there Jesus begins to pray, and his prayer can be broken into three parts. Uh, he begins by praying for himself which is, it's an extraordinary thing, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Then he prays for the 12, he, well, the 11, right? The 11 who are in the room with him. And then he prays an extended bit for all who would come after. That's you and me. He spends time praying for us before he goes to Golgotha, before the cross, and so, we, we want to talk about that, but what, when we read this, I want to highlight a couple of things here that Jesus prays about. First of all, I want to highlight um, how much of God's love is expressed in this prayer. So, as we read it, I want that to be in your mind. How much of God's love is being expressed in the midst of this prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ? Secondly, I want us to see how God feels about unity and what He thinks about unity. And so we're going to talk about that extensively, the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. So before we do all of that, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord above, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for you alone are good. Even the Lord Jesus said this, that you alone are good. And so, uh, we come to you and recognize your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love toward us. And I pray that you would be, within, be with us in this time. I pray, Lord God, that as we have emotions that are uh, up and down and flowing, and we have thoughts that are racing through our minds, and, and we have uh, opinions about this and that and the other thing, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and bring peace, that we would experience your peace, your shalom, my Lord and my God. I pray that you would come upon us and that you would help us then to internalize your word for your word is truth. And so I pray, please be with me as I preach your word. Help me to do it with integrity and with accuracy and with power through the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you be with each one of us, giving us ears to hear and eyes to see 
help our minds to conceive and, and to grab on to the truth that you want us to, to hold on to and help our hearts to be transformed so that we might become more and more like the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we all pray. Amen. Amen. So here we go, John chapter 17, starting in verse 1, and it goes like this. Father, the hour has come. So uh, by the way, uh, as I go through this, I'm going to be stopping and starting and stopping and starting, and that's just the way it's going to go today. So, you know, there you go. That's, that's reality, okay? So, Father, the hour has come. What's Jesus starting with? He's starting with this idea that He already sees the cross before Him. He knows that, that the days of His ministry are, in essence, are finished, that He's no longer going to be doing miracles and preaching and teaching and healing and all those kinds of things, and now He's going to be suffering for our sake. He's going to be uh, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be abused, he's going to be falsely accused, he's going to be maligned, he's going to be stripped, and he's going to be hung upon the cross. That's what's coming, and Jesus already knows it. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given to Him. I want you to stop for a minute and think about, think about the, the, the unity within the Godhead. Here we have Jesus who is talking to the Father, and, and there is such a beautiful cyclic conversation happening. And He is saying, God, You gave me things so that I could give You things. You glorify me so that I can glorify You. You remember me and I remember You. It's the cycle of unity that whatever the Father is, the Son is, and whatever the Son is, the Father is, and however it's all working together, it's working as one unit, one God unified. So that's what we see here, even in verse 2, for, for you granted Him, that's, that's Jesus, authority over all people, that He might give eternal life to those you have given Him. Now we get a definition, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, Jesus tells us, knowing God in the Father and in the Son. And that is His clear uh, spoken word. And I don't know if you have a red letter edition or not, but this is definitely the red letter. This is the words of Jesus spoken to the Father for the benefit of the disciples, including us. Verse 5, and now, oh wait, I, I apologize, verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. We'll circle back to that. And now, Father, glorify me with your presence, in your presence, with the glory I had with you before the world began. This is just, just another clear example of Jesus speaking out loud let there be no doubt, I am the eternal one. I am the one who was before, the one who is, and the one who will be. And he says that not, you know, to some homeless person on the street in a quiet, dark alley. No, he says that in the context of a prayer to his Father in front of the disciples. There is no ambiguity here. Jesus is God. So that concludes his prayer, and, and one of the beautiful things about this prayer is that Jesus isn't ashamed or, or it, it timid about asking for a thing that none of us would ever dare to ask for. God, give me your glory. 
Moses, who was very bold in his prayer with God, and in the midst of, you know, maybe you remember the story of Moses, and, and, and God had, had been, become angry and said, okay, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel with you. And Moses had said, hey, if, if, if you don't go with us, don't send us at all. And in the, in the midst of that, and in the midst of that wrestling with God, so to speak, Moses then goes, but, but God, show me your glory. Show me your, and that was a bold request from Moses, show me your glory. And of course, the Lord answers that by saying, okay, well, I'm going to put you in this cave, and I'm going to put my hand over the cave, and I'm going to walk by, and you can see, you know, like the hem of the garment after I'm gone, and we know the story, that after that happened, of course, Moses glowed <laughs> for a few days with the glory of God. He came down off the mountain, and the people were like, whoa, dude, uh, you're glowing, I don't know if you know you're glowing, but we got to put some extra clothes on you because you're freaking us all out. Jesus doesn't say, show me your glory. Jesus says, give me glory. Give me glory. In fact, not just any glory, but the glory I had with you in eternity past. Give me glory. I think... Well, there's only one that can ask God for that and not just be obliterated on the spot. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, now Jesus begins to pray for his disciples, the 11 who were left in the room. And this is what he says, I have revealed, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I have given them the words you gave me and accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not only praying for the world, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and, the, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the Scriptures would be fulfilled. So I want to stop here for just a minute and think about what is it that Jesus is praying for the men in the room, for the people who are literally there with Him. He's praying something specific. And, and one of the things He's saying is, I already know my time on the earth is not long. I am headed back to, to, to your right hand, Father God. That's where Jesus is going. And his mind is set on that, and his heart is set on that, and, and there is clarity in, in who he thinks, uh, what he, he believes is going to happen. And so, so there's that. But then what we see is the two things we talked about at the beginning. Jesus loves these people. He loves them. And how do we know that he loves them? Because he says, he says, Father God, I recognize that I'm going to go. And when I do, they're going to come under attack. That's going to happen. And I know it. And so, Father God, Jesus prays, protect them. Because I won't be here to do it anymore. Protect them. And if, I, if that's not love, I don't know what love is. That is certainly love. And, and even when we watch the news and we see uh, all of the people who are still fleeing Ukraine and we see all of the images I'm sure that you have seen on the news and, and, and wherever you, 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 you view these things, what you see is so often you see mothers and children, you see grandparents and, and moms and kids and dad who is left behind fighting in Ukraine for his country, and mom who is, who is what? Protecting her kids. 
and the grandparents are doing their best to protect the children. Because this is how we love. We protect those we love. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's showing clarity of his love. Father, protect them in my absence. And now we get into this uh, sort of strange language, I think. When we, when we read it again, we see that, that there's, it, it's not an ordinary kind of protection, right? When we, th- when we think of protection, we think of like, okay, so I'm, <laughs> we were in Wyoming, and I'm holding my granddaughter in my arms, and, and I'm going to put her in the car so she can go home with her parents. And, and what do I want? I want to protect her. I want to protect her. I move heaven and earth to protect her, right? So what am I doing? I'm, I'm putting her in a car seat. I'm not just going to like, hey, have, have, a, have a safe trip home, kid. Throw her in the car and slam the door and walk away. No, I'm like, okay, how does this car seat work? I want to make sure I understand how this car seat works because I want her to be protected in case there's a crash. So I'm like, okay, we've got to understand how this works and what's going on. Now, now, now some of you... You had car seats a long time ago. I had car seats a long time ago. (laughs) Car seats are different now. (laughs) They're so complicated now. Like you got to have face the right direction. It's got to be at the right angle. There's a little bubble that tells what level is, and you got to have the strap, and it's got to like you got to lay on top of the car seat to get the thing tight with the strap, and and then when you put the kid in the car seat, then it's not just like. It's not just a buckle. It's like you got to put their little arms in, and then you got the face protector slider things that go on the straps, and they got to be in the right position. And then you got to click the thing in on that side and click the thing in on this. It's less complicated to drive a race car. <laughs> click and click and click and click and, and slide and move. And, and of course, when you're putting a one year old in a car seat, she is not thinking. Poppy, I'm so grateful that you care so much that you want to protect me and keep me safe. You know, she's thinking, I want my toys. I want to get out of this place. I want to go play. I like the dog. Let go of me. And there's the flailing and the crying and all the... Father, protect them, because I'm going to leave this place, Jesus says. But then there's something specific in how he says it. He says it this way, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Holy Father. This is an interesting thing, okay? Jesus is praying, for sure, and he's teaching. And I don't want you to miss that. He's praying and he's teaching. He's talking to God and he's also telling his disciples more about who the Father is. In all of the Gospel of John, Jesus talks to the Father countless times. Countless times he talks to the Father. Father, this and that and the other thing and I'm praying and and, and he teaches about the Father. You know, I only do the thing that the Father gave me to do and so on and so forth. And here he stops and he doesn't just say, Father. He says, Holy Father. He says to the disciples, Guys, listen closely as I reveal more about the Father to you in these last days. Holy Father. Holy Father. Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me. And what is he saying there? This is verse 11. He's saying, you have revealed yourself in special ways throughout history. Father God, you have revealed yourself in special ways. And one of the ways is the way that you revealed yourself to Moses at the burning bush. We all remember the burning bush story. 
And, and, and Moses is like, that's weird. That bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. I'm going to go over there and check that out. And he shows up, and the voice of God speaks to Moses. And he says, whoa, you need to take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And Moses realizes this isn't just special. It is divine. God is at work. And in the midst of that little conversation, he reveals himself. God reveals himself to Moses, and there we get the word that we sort of understand because we're not Jewish. We sort of understand Yahweh. And the Jewish people have such reverence for the word, they barely speak it, if at all. Because it is the revelation of God to his people. And so God revealed himself through his name. And it is translated, I am. And it is not just a revelation of God, it is a revelation of his eternality. God is eternal. And this is part of what Jesus is talking about. That it isn't just, uh, you know, if you're traveling as an emissary of a king... And you show up and some people decide that they want to kidnap you or kill you or whatever. You may be able to say to them, I am am here on behalf of King Gustav or King John or whatever it is, right? I am here and the power of the name protects you in your travels. This is still true today, right? If you're a U.S. citizen and you travel somewhere in the world and you show up there and people want to kidnap you. Now, maybe being a U.S. citizen is a, is, a, is a help, and maybe it's a hindrance, right, depending on where you are in the world. In some cases, if they find out you're, you're a U.S. citizen, they'll be like, whoa, okay, I don't want to mess with you. In other cases, they'll say, yeah, you're exactly who I want to kidnap. Because the power of, of being a U.S. citizen isn't, <laughs> it isn't everything. But the power of being under God's name, it is. It's everything. It is the revelation of God in who He is, and it is the revelation of the power of God over these people, over this 11. And then Jesus talks about the why. And I think we underestimate the power of the why. What does it say here in verse 11? It says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Why? So that they may be one as we are one. Jesus cares about unity. He cares about it. It's important to him. In fact, he says it's the reason he prays for protection for these 11 men. The word so exists in the passage for a reason. It is purpose. It is meaning. It is reasoning. It is justification. In Jesus' mind, this is why. And lest you be confused, let's move on. Verse, Verse 20 says this, My prayer is not for them alone, but I also pray for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so the world might believe that you sent me. Jesus doesn't just pray for the unity of the eleven. He prays for the unity of the church, of us all. That we might be protected through the power of his name, that we might have unity. Unity. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a second. Let's read the rest of this passage, uh, starting in verse 13. This is what Jesus says. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of joy with them. Jesus loves. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. 
your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be sanctified. So that's all about the 11 who are in the room that Jesus wants to have their, they want, he wants them to understand and he wants them to be sanctified. Okay, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who have given, you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, now pay attention. This is the big finish. Verse 25. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Do you see that? I think that is staggering. That Jesus goes to the Father and says, the love you have for me, put it in them. That's us, church. That's Jesus asking His Father to give the love that was destined for Him to us. We don't understand that. We can't wrap our minds around that. We can't begin to think what that really means. One day we will know. We sort of have inklings of it. We sort of see it little bits. We see it at the cross. We see that the Father sent the Son to stand in our place, and that is such an extraordinary act of love. We can't possibly even think about the, the thing that Jesus endured in our place for our benefit, but we do know He loves us. And why? He wants us to be unified. He wants us to be unified. So I just want to talk for one minute about what that means. When Jesus talked about unity, one of the things he said was, I have done the things you asked me to do. Being unified begins with being in right standing with God. If we walk in obedience before God, our chances of being unified with one another increase. When Suzanne and I were doing youth ministry, we used to talk to, to, to boys and girls, because boys and girls are always in love, and they don't love like, you know, this much. Their love is always way up here, like explosions of love, and I can't believe that my parents have said, I can't see so-and-so, he's the most amazing guy in the history of the world, and I, I love him so much, and so on and so forth, and, and, and this is what we, you know, <laughs> this is what we used to teach uh, uh, young, young men and women, we used to teach them this. If you seek God with all of your heart and your future spouse is also doing the same thing, seeking God with all of their heart, you'll meet each other in that place where the will of God brings you together. You see that? This is us, church. It's us on a grander scale, all of us. If we set aside our will, our desires, our selfishness, and we seek God with all of our heart, and everybody else around us in Christ is seeking God with all of their hearts, unity happens. It is a consequence of our love for God and our obedience to Him. 
And people, I think, have this misunderstanding of unity, that unity is a force of will. It is a force of setting aside your will and saying, well, I think that person is stupid and everything they stand for is stupid, but I love them in Jesus, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be unified with them. <laughs> You're not that strong. You're not that strong. You can't just set aside everything you think is good and smart and wise just to, to pretend like... Because unity isn't, it isn't uh, 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 some kind of goal of, of human endeavor. It isn't something that you can strive for in your own strength. It is a consequence of rightly loving and obeying God. But when we do that, some things happen. When you rightly love and obey God... You are humble. Because when you remember who God is, humility is a consequence. You are humble. And when you're humble, you recognize whatever wisdom I have, it came from God. Whatever I desire, I want my desires to match with God. Whatever my hopes are, my dreams are, the, 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 the purpose of my heart and my life, I want all those things to align with what God wants. And when you do that, being unified becomes, well, it's easy because it's a consequence of right relationship with Jesus. You get that, church? I hope we get that. I hope we get that. And I hope we understand God cares about this. He doesn't put this in the context of, of the, 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 this, is, um, this is Jesus' prayer. He doesn't put that here on accident. He cares about his people being united. He wants us to have one heart and one mind working together for his purposes. That he would be glorified and that we would be blessed. So, let's pray today and ask God to continue to purify our hearts. Ask God to continue to humble us and bring us into right relationship with Him so that we would have healthy relationship with our God so that we would be unified with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Can you pray that with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today recognizing that we are sinners, that we are weak, that we are selfish, that our first thoughts tend to be about our own desires, that we tend to overestimate our own wisdom, that we have a, a, a propensity to doing the thing that we think is good, that we think is right, that we think is helpful. And we don't always even check in with you first, and so forgive us. Forgive me, Lord. I know there are many times when I have gone about doing things and I haven't even sought for your will. But in these days where so much is at stake, I pray, help us, Lord, to walk in humility before you. Help us, Lord, to be in right relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to consist, consistently come before you asking for you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Help us, Lord, to forgive others when they sin against us. And help us, Lord, to be one, to be united, to be one united church here that calls itself Waypoint Christian Fellowship, but also to be united with brothers and sisters who are in Christ around the world. We think of those who are uh, in Ukraine, brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling there, and we ask that you would be merciful to them. But they're not the only ones. We, we, we think also, Lord, of, of brothers and sisters in Christ in, in other nations. We know that there, there is... Uh, ongoing persecution for those who are in 
the Middle East and those who are in India and those who are, who are in China and, and certainly in certain parts of, of Africa, Lord God, there's much persecution. And so we pray, be with our brothers and sisters there and around the world. But here in this time, I pray, help us to trust in you and to walk by faith and to walk in unity as your church. We love you. We trust in you. We believe that you continue to work out things for our good and for your glory. We pray together all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I love you very much, and I'm very excited because we have such a wonderful opportunity to fellowship and to celebrate, and also to, well, maybe not you, but I get to kiss Lori on the head and wish her happy birthday. So, in the meantime, uh, if, if you're a member and you have a ballot and you can turn it in to, to Suzanne, I know Forrest is back there, Gary's over here. Tim's over there. You can give the ballot to any of the elders in the room, and 